Yes, Representative Awana. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Should I offend anyone during my speech, I apologize in advance. My intent, although inadvertent, is not to offend, but to simply share my point of view through the eyes of the overwhelming amount of testimony in opposition to this measure. Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1, continues to be one of concern. On page 1 of the bill, it states that the federal government does not recognize civil unions and same-sex couples will not be recognized by the federal law. Why are we having this conversation at the state level? This issue should be taken up at the federal level, Mr. Speaker. We provide rights to civil union couples and those with reciprocal benefits at the state level. Civil unions and reciprocal benefits was the great compromise just a few years ago in 2011. We were told that if we provide these options, the GLBT community, they would be satisfied. Have the people of Hawaii not done enough? We gave you your civil unions. We gave you your reciprocal benefits. We don't have signs that say straight people only. We don't have signs that say GLBT to the rear of the bus. And we don't have separate water fountains for GLBT individuals. Have we not already shared our aloha spirit with you, our customs, our culture? Religious rights will be compromised, and I will go over that later. But our keiki, our children, our future, now in our public school system, it's happening in Hawaii, Mr. Speaker, as mentioned earlier. And it's happened in Canada, where the same-sex marriage is legal. It's happened in the mainland, where the same-sex marriage is legal. And now it's in our public school system as we stand here to debate this bill. It's masking itself as, quote, unquote, culturally responsive teen pregnancy and STI prevention program. And guess who created this program? Our very own University of Hawaii at Manoa Center on Disability Studies. Guess who their partners are? Alulike, Berkeley Policy Associates, Hawaii Department of Education, Planned Parenthood of Hawaii. And guess where it's currently being taught? On all major islands, throughout the state. The Department of Education did not provide testimony at the House Joint Hearings. They're already implementing the programs to indoctrinate our children into believing that homosexual relations are normal and healthy, and heterosexual relationships are abnormal and unhealthy. A concerned parent brought this information to our attention. He attended a parents' meeting introducing a new sex education curriculum for seventh graders being piloted at the university. He and many other parents were alarmed. It not only teaches hands-on experience on putting a condom on or something, but also teaching how to have homosexual sex, including oral and anal sex. Alluding to the fact that it may even be better than heterosexual sex because you don't have to worry about getting pregnant. The module also includes discussions about relationships and three scenarios were given. The two heterosexual scenarios were negative, while the homosexual scenario was painted to be very peaceful and positive. When the parents questioned the presenters why this curriculum promotes homosexual sex as better than heterosexual sex, the answer was, because that is how the UH wrote it. The department, uh, let me see here. Another point, Mr. Speaker, many have made claims that, that same-sex marriage is a civil right. I believe the people of Hawaii compromised with the same-sex marriage issue back in 2011 when we passed it, passed the Civil Unions Bill. Testimony during that time in order for the bill's passage claimed that the GLBT community would stop at civil unions. I did not support civil unions at that time, Mr. Speaker, because I knew this was a slippery slope, which would be a nightmare of a bill that we are looking at today in Senate Bill 1, House Draft 1. An article by then doctoral student in financial economics, Adam Kolininski from MIT, wrote the following, and I'll just read a few passages. The debate over whether the state ought to recognize gay marriages has thus far focused on the issues as one of civil rights. Such a treatment is erroneous because the state recognition of marriage is not a universal right. States regulate marriage in many ways besides denying men the right to marry men and women the right to marry women. 
Roughly half of all states prohibit first cousins from marrying and all prohibit marriage of closer blood relatives, even if the individuals being married are sterile. In all states, it is illegal to attempt to marry more than one group. All right, there is uh, time has elapsed for you. It's, uh, Someone Please, want to contribute somebody. your time? Thank Mr. you. Mr. Speaker, I yield my time. Sorted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roughly half of all states prohibit first cousins from marrying and all prohibit marriage of closer blood relatives, even if the individuals being married are sterile. In all states, it is illegal to attempt to marry more than one person or even to pass off more than one person as one spouse. Some states restrict the marriage of couples of people suffering from syphilis or other venereal diseases. Homosexuals, therefore, are not the only people to be denied the right to marry the person of their choosing. I do not claim that all of these other types of couples restricted from marrying are equivalent to homosexual couples. I only bring them up to illustrate that marriage is heavily regulated and for good reason. When a state recognizes a marriage, it bestows upon the couple certain benefits which are close costly to both the state and other individuals. Collecting a deceased spouse's social security, claiming an extra tax exemption for a spouse, and having the right to be covered under a spouse's health insurance policy are just a few examples of the costly benefits associated with marriage. In a sense, a married couple receives a subsidy. Why? Because a marriage between two unrelated heterosexuals is likely to result in a family with children and propagation of society is a compelling state interest. For this reason, states have, in varying degrees, restricted from marriage couples unlikely to produce children. And perhaps it may serve a state's interest to recognize gay marriages to make it easier for gay couples to adopt. However, there is ample evidence, if you see David Popenoy's Life Without Father, that children need both male and female parents for proper development. Unfortunately, small sample sizes for other methodological problems make it impossible to draw conclusions from studies that directly examine the effects of gay parenting. However, empirically verified common wisdom about the importance of a mother and a father in a child's development should give advocates of gay adoption pause. The differences between men and women extend beyond anatomy, so it is essential for a child to be nurtured by parents of both sexes if a child is to learn to function in a society made up of both sexes. It is wise to have a social policy that encourages family arrangements that deny children such essentials. Gays are not necessarily bad parents, nor will they necessarily make their children gay, but they cannot provide a set of parents that includes both male and female. The language in relation to accommodations can still be misinterpreted, Mr. Speaker. Few religious organizations have the fund to defend themselves in lengthy lawsuits. The passage of this bill is a lawyer's retirement plan. I can only imagine how many lawsuits will be filed against religious organizations and those of faith. It is already happening here in Hawaii. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, I believe we as legislators are bound to those that we represent. I have sent out surveys and 78% in my district are in opposition to anything relating to same-sex marriage. We all have friends and family members who are of the GLBT persuasion, myself included, and my vote as a con is a conduit for my constituents and this vote will not stop me from giving my aloha to the GLBT community the same way that I have in the past. I am appalled at how this measure has come before us the dreadful language that is being used in this bill and the divisiveness that was caused by the people behind this special session. To the GLBT community, I commit the resources of my office to find a solution. I will work tirelessly to establish equal rights for you so that you may have the respect, dignity, and acceptance you deserve. By use of an executive order or proclamation, the president may establish policy that grants federal recognition to civil unions enacted in the states that allow them and which directs executive branches to implement the directive immediately. Unfortunately, this fight is not at the state level, Mr. Speaker. It's at the federal level. Political parties are divided. We're divided in the chamber, and so are the people of Hawaii. 
I want Hawaii to be preserved as a Hawaii we have known. People save all of their life savings to come here and experience our Hawaii. They want to experience the Hawaiian people. That is what makes us special to anywhere in the world, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and members, let's not make Mr. this Speaker, huge mistake that Mr. we cannot Speaker, take time back. Is up. Let's time it's just is one, up. ten more seconds, please. Generations will have to endure and only wonder how it all came about. Should this bill pass, Mr. Speaker, as a native Hawaiian born and raised in the islands, I will feel like a stranger in my own homeland. The process and the language in this bill is not pono. And for Wrap the future up. of Hawaii and the future of the Hawaiian kingdom that continues to lie dormant, Mr. Speaker, I vote in opposition. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much.